everyone. Welcome to the Responsible AI podcast. My name is Anusha Seturaman. I'm the VP of Marketing at Fiddler AI. Today I have with me on the show Lofred Matsu, who is an AI project lead at the World Economic Forum. Thank you so much for joining us today, Lofred. It's really great to have you here. Do you, you mind doing me. Yeah, do you mind doing a quick introduction of yourself? Sure. Uh, project lead for AI at the at the World Economic Forum. I've been working there for Two and a half years now, uh, managing various regulation projects across various jurisdictions. Before that, I was working for French government, already on AI uh, policy and tech policy more broadly, and I studied data science and philosophy uh, at Oxford University. Way to go! Great. Well, let's jump right into it. Um, so, tell us what is responsible AI to you? How do you think about it? I think responsible AI really comes down to ensuring that any given AI system, you know, its behavior is consistent with a set of requirements. And I'm, I'm, I'm telling this because it's all about behavior of a system while in operation. And then we can discuss what are these requirements. So I really want to focus more responsible as a method instead of having specific principles because the principles or requirements are really context dependent. Okay, so what, uh, what are some of these methods and how do you, how do you think about it? Well, for, for, uh, for instance, if you want to use facial recognition technology for uh, boarding a plane, obviously, you know, there are some, some benefits you want to improve the flow of passengers, but also you're likely to face some challenges. One of them being a biometric data is a really sensitive data. So it raises questions regarding privacy, regarding consent, regarding cybersecurity. You don't want that data being compromised, data retention, mm -hmm. and so forth. If you want to use it, let's say, for law enforcement investigations, it raises a very different set of questions. But either way, depending on the use case, you can have a very structured method to identify whatever risks associated with that use case and come up with risk mitigation strategies to effectively address this risk, again, based on the use case that you are uh, trying to address. So I like this. It feels like a very localized approach to the specific use case. And, you know, you have, it's not like a general, maybe there are general guidelines and you evolve these local use case specific guidelines from there. But every use case you're saying will have its own limitations, its own constraints that you have to think about it as a use case holistically on how to uh, enable that use case to be built responsibly. That's correct. That's correct. It's really important because if you look at there are dozens of ethical AI frameworks, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they have all their own, own merits. But one of the, it really demonstrates one thing at least is that there's no universal framework. Otherwise people won't bother drafting new frameworks, right? Uh, and one of the reasons why is because all these frameworks are, I mean, relevant frameworks are really context dependent because you want to address the risks linked to a use case. Don't get me wrong. There's always a kind of like broader background uh, set of requirements, legal requirements that are much broader, right? But the interpretation of these requirements, even in the judicial system, are really context dependent on a use case based, right? Yeah. That's the similar approach I try to apply to responsible AI. Got it. So what are some industries that you have worked with a lot to implement some responsible AI use cases? Well, I work a lot mostly now in my capacity with uh, you know, uh, actors in the airport industry okay. and more broadly actors trying to use uh, official recognition technology uh, as part of the managing, managing various flows. It could be like you know, accessing a stadium or a building or a train station in an airport, but that's what I've been focusing uh, the most uh, uh, lately. So can you give um, an instance of maybe how you, for a particular use case, how did you go about implementing uh, maybe a specific responsible AI framework or guidelines for that particular use case? Sure. Uh, this one I think is, is, quite, uh, is quite illustrative. In that, in that case, so again, thinking about boarding a plane with your face on an airport, again, what... I mean, it goes without saying that we are trying to use facial recognition technology in that domain because we perceive some, some benefits, right? Mm -hmm. But there are also some concerns. So we built a four step, I would say, uh, um, process mm -hmm. to implement our governance framework. First, what to define what is a responsible use in that use case. And here it's really important. Two elements are important. Who are we? And it starts by building the right committee of stakeholders mm -hmm. from the business tech providers the airport, but also representatives of passengers, mm. 
civil society uh, activists, regulators, trying to capture for our principle for action what we agreed upon being a responsible use in that case, right? So, and that's why it's a bit tricky because when it comes to responsible eye, in many instances, these discussions are internal to companies, either tech providers, okay. but really you don't have like the, what I call the collaborative process yeah. to capture the insights of the people affected by your system. That's a really good point. Yeah. And so you're saying right at the beginning, before you even start implementing this use case, have representatives from people who might be impacted by this, uh, from the society in general, exactly. cultural representatives uh, to see. So there are diverse voices in the room as you're figuring out what, you know, what, 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 how do you actually like think about what this use case is going to, um, how it's going to be implemented. That's a really good point. So how did that work out? Were you able to do it? Were you able to like get these folks in a room or on a Zoom? Yeah. It, it took quite a while, but we're quite successful. We started with airports based uh, in the EU and then we managed to have like stakeholders from, from Japan. So it became a really uh, a global committee of, of, of stakeholders and we have actually an event coming soon to promote the governance framework. The second step is once we agreed on the principles for action, it was how do you put them into operation? Uh -huh. Well, we designed a set of design requirements for tech providers saying, if you are to comply with these principles for action, that's how we should be building or designing your system. That's how you know, that's how you should be uh, taking them into consideration. And again, that requires a very close collaboration with tech providers. And then we moved into a self-assessment questionnaire for airports because they're the customer facing company, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Company, sorry, uh, being also uh, accountable for passengers because they're interacting with, pass with passengers, not directly. Tech providers don't interact directly with, with passengers. And then we moved on co-drafting this audit framework. That's the last stage in yeah. collaboration with the leading uh, certification body in the EU, within the EU. And now we, you know, we moved into the implementation. So it was quite successful in this regard. That, yeah, it's, it's a very involved process, right? And I'm sure you encountered yeah. a lot of challenges along the way. What were some of these challenges that stood out to you? Well, uh, what I call like the... Uh, Two elements, because um, one thing I forgot to mention is I'm working at the WEF, but I'm also a research associate at the Oxford Intent Institute, mm -hmm. looking at the audit of AI systems more broadly and, and, and philosophy of AI. Why I'm making that link is one of the biggest changes is what I call the translation gap. Now you have like various stakeholders with various perspectives. That's one thing. So that different risk perception. So then you have to align on this risk perception, let alone risk prioritization, assuming that we can map out the different risks Let's agree on what is the most important, depending on being a passenger or tech provider or airport, you have like different views in it, right? But let's move into this is what I call the translation gap is between the legal and ethical discourse, don't discriminate, well, fair enough. No one comes into a room saying, I'm going to discriminate, right? What does it mean in terms of the design of my system, its deployment, the training of the people using the system, potential audits while the system is in operation, what does it mean? And I'm trying to bridge that gap between the legal and ethical discourse yeah. and what I call like the uh, design requirements, what I you know, working with product teams, yeah. working with the, the tech companies on the ground. So um, one of the things that, you know, others constantly say is like, very often the challenges end up being cultural or company related. So how do people, when you were doing this project, what was the response like from everyone involved in this project from these different groups? How did they collaborate together? Was there any, were, were there any challenges there or was everyone sort of aligned and working well together? Let, let, let's put it this way. It, it worked well because it was a coalition of, of a winning, like actor, you know, actors willing to move on, on this. And also being at the WEF, we can, we don't have any like constraining power. We're not re regulator, right? Yeah. So this kind of collaboration can only work with actors who perceive the benefits of engaging into that work. If you have too much disagreements and disalignments, you cannot make meaningful progress uh, because there's no way to you know, force people to stay into the, the, the project, uh, so to speak. And that's why there are some issues that can be addressed by the industry and from the stakeholder collaboration. And there are over considerations that should be addressed by the regulators or policy makers because there are more, uh, you know, um, I would say governance power but also enforcement mechanisms to make sure that we're moving in the right direction. So you have to really make an assessment about what is the type of problem you're trying to address here and what is the right collaborative model. 
What, um, in terms of like the technologies that you used, what were some challenges that you came across there or that you recommended that the teams use? What were maybe some of those um, challenges? Were there any technological challenges that you came across? What do you mean by, as part of the collaboration? So like as, not as part of the collaboration, but as you're implementing Responsible AI, were there some limitations to you needed specific technologies or you needed specific um, not, skill not, sets? Not, not specifically in that case, because that's a good point. What we built is you know, an uh, audit management system. And okay. I, I really want to be specific here. It was really about the governance of the system itself. Okay. And not specifically on, you know, uh, I would say audits of the, of, the, uh, of the AI system. So it's quite obscure. Let's be really concrete here. For instance, we gave recommendation on, I'm going to give a concrete one, on performance and accuracy. One of the biggest concerns when it comes to facial recognition technology. We're not the NIST, so we're not like assessing the performance of the FRT solution that airports are procuring, let alone coming up with a threshold or standard for what is considered as like a, a, a performing system. But what we put in place is a requirement for airports to run this kind of assessments. NIST okay. does it at what we call the lab, uh, in lab condition, mm -hmm. was them to do so in field condition. Mm -hmm. And that's up to them to decide what is the right technical means to achieve that goal. Audit. That's the difference here. So what were, so you put together this audit framework basically as a third party, maybe, and you're mm -hmm. saying, hey, as you're building this particular responsible or this AI solution, here's uh, guidelines for you to follow here. This system has to meet XYZ requirement or ABC requirement. What were some of those requirements? So on, on this specific case, for instance, um, I think many of the considerations that we faced were regarding data governance. Mm -hmm. Because again, biometric data is already sensitive data. Yeah. One of them being, Retention. So, assuming that what basically requirements and how to get consent. Yeah. And also, a lot of requirements, but let's assume that I don't want to use facial recognition technology mm -hmm. as a passenger. I'm being penalized. No. Why? Because there's a requirement of a fallback system, an alternative to facial okay. recognition technology. That alternative should be equally uh, beneficial uh, to passengers and so forth. You should be Got transparent it. regarding the data retention time. The, usually 24 hours after departing, that data shouldn't be, if it's you know, collected for, for, for that purpose, it shouldn't be used for the purpose of my, 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 my consent. So that's work we did more at the governance level. But as you may aware, I've published a piece more recently, yeah. on, you know, uh, you know, it's five steps to scale responsible. Like that, that is more like, I would say like more, more for companies that it, because it looks like internally, what can we do to, to govern responsible AI? as opposed to the multi-stakeholder process that I've described now that is much more demanding and higher level from much more mature companies. So tell us a little bit about this five-step guide to responsible AI, to scale responsible, or to deploy responsible AI at scale. I think that was what you called it. Yeah. Um, what, uh, what was the thinking behind it as you were developing it? I'm wondering if you used some experience to actually say, okay, this is what is actually working from what I've deployed in the past. And then how do you see this being used by different organizations? It's a very good point. So uh, I would like to give love credit to my co-writer, which is uh, uh, Danny Lang, uh, is the SV SVP for AI at Unity and the former uh, manager uh, for AI at Uber and, and Microsoft and so on. Um, the question I asked Danny was, was quite simple, considering his over 25 years of experience in the industry and my expertise working at, at the forum is, you have scaled AI really well in many of like the most successful companies worldwide. What are the, some, of the, some of the key takeaways? But what you were doing at the time, there were not so much concerns regarding ethical AI and so forth. If you had to do it again with that responsible AI lens, how would you go about this? Mm -hmm. That was the starting process saying, okay, I come from industry, I come from regulation. Yeah. Assuming we had to do it again, how would you do so? Yeah. And in doing so, um, we are going to fight five key steps, uh, maybe like going through them and tell you the thinking behind. Yeah. The first one sounds really basic. You have to define what it means to be responsible. And here, what I mean here is, again, responsible is all about ensuring that my system is consistent, my system's behavior with a set of requirements. It's all about ensuring consistency with requirements. Mm -hmm. So now you have to define what are these requirements and they have to be linked to the AI applications that you're ready. 
So when you mapped out these applications, what they're supposed to be doing, you ask yourself how things can go wrong mm -hmm. and start about having a more refined matrix. For instance, I give you just one. If you think about uh, you know, uh, the way uh, systems performance are assessed now in the industry, it's mostly like on benchmark data sets, right? Performance on your benchmark data sets. It's a rather narrow approach of performance. If you have like a more holistic approach, more like understanding of what are these requirements, much more formalized, you will be in a better position to ensuring consistency. So it starts by defining. Okay, can you give an example? Like if you were to go about using this guide to um, deploy a response AI solution today, maybe, uh, Maybe actually, why don't we use another example that you worked on? Like you worked mm -hmm. with the government of New Zealand, right? Yeah. On deploying uh, something with them. What, how would you go about it? Like what were some of these, um, what's the first step you would do? What, how would you define what is responsible there? Well, uh, usually when we start with this, that's interesting because in the context of, of, of a government and also mostly like with, uh, with also companies, it starts by looking at the existing regulatory framework. And so oh, it's really broad, it's not that broad. You go next door to your risk and compliance folks mm -hmm. and they tell you in our industry, these are some of the basic fundamental rules, That's let right. it be in finance, in HR, whatever it is, right? So you go next door to the legal department, it gives you a kind of like background of where you, you know, of your industry and what are the basic kind of uh, uh, um, expectations. That's, that's one thing. The second thing is you're looking at the business objectives of your system, because when I'm talking about risk here, legal is really the basis. It's about what are the over risk? What are the reputational risk? So you do kind of like, you know, uh, a search of what are the controversies in this space? In the HR, it's a really controversial space. What, what people are concerned about, how things can go wrong, how it can impact the, uh, the applicants, for instance. Mm -hmm. And you, you may be thinking that it's really broad. It's not, it's not because if you stay close to the use case that you have and you really narrow it down to, what I'm supposed to be doing and how things can go wrong, I'm starting with a legal background, you quickly identify it. For instance, in the government, it's a bit different because we build there like a risk and compliance, uh, a risk and benefits assessment framework. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's critical because the stakes are much higher. Mm. Obviously, governments are much more risk averse, you know, not only because of their accountability towards citizens and the election cycle and so forth, right. but because the whole regulatory system for governments is designed to make sure that they fought twice before doing something, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there, what we're doing is before using AI for uh, any like public operations, for instance, um, let's say you have like some more controversial uses, one of them might be delivering like fraud to social benefits. You can quickly see how things can go wrong there, like vulnerable communi communities and so forth. Well, you may double check first, you know, what is the phenomena, get a sense to work with like, you know, social workers, what are the issues, you know, working with people on the ground to get a sense of what is the reality before going on and try to automate, automate that process. It may turn out that this is not really possible, not that easy. That's one example here. Not everyone is always gonna have the time to go on the ground and kind of like, you know, spend all this time to really understand how it works. Maybe some folks do, but if you had to speed it up, what would you do? Well, if, if I had to, to speed it up, um, first, like assuming that, because one thing also I want to mention is that many companies have, 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 have moved on and like could, could have uh, could drafted sort of these principles, think about Microsoft and, and so okay. forth. Yeah. Then like you, you, you bring in the, the, the talent. Again, there's more and more people being trained in responsible AI and ethical AI who got the honest, the tools, they know about the frameworks and so on. So you try to building like internal uh, capabilities. And again, it's all about addressing risk tied to a product. So you bring the risk and compliance folks and the uh, product teams much closer to get a sense of how in our like, you know, specific use case, uh, how things can go wrong. Um, also, as I said about the uh, uh, holistic you know, performance matrix, you try to build this internal task force that is going to help you operationalize your internal kind of principle. So it sounds really like demanding, it's not. If you have a right task force, mm -hmm. risk and compliance force, product teams, yeah. executives, uh, you know, in the room, you have a business applications that you're trying to, you know, operationalize with AI and you mapped out the risks, you can work this out. Got it. So this is still the first step where you're actually defining what is responsible AI for com your company. What comes after that? Well, the second steps, uh, is really building uh, additional capabilities. And here, what I, what I mean here is, uh, 
you know, designing and deploying just for AI systems is, is an organization-wide effort. And here, interestingly enough, it's about raising awareness. Again, mm-hmm. risk considerations, but risk identification, monitoring, and mitigation. Mm-hmm. Nothing more, nothing less, okay? This risk, because of the nature of, you know, uh, learning systems, um, this risk, as opposed to classic like recent compliance, are going to affect various business functions. So what you want to make sure is that you train everyone on responsible AI. It's not just a matter of having your data scientists having some sense of, oh, that's illegal, that's illegal, whatever. It's a broader awareness regarding what are the AI applications that we have in the company, how they work, mm-hmm. how things can go wrong, and getting various perspective and training. So you invest in training across the organization. And then what I call like cross-functional collaboration. So uh, with classic AI team, what we, you know, uh, what you do usually is you build internal capabilities with like some, maybe like uh, what we call like a center for AI excellence, but center is a bit big word, but let's say a task force with, you know, data scientists, you know, experts in running out uh, AI and responsible AI folks, but also we should be linked to business champions mm-hmm. working in various business functions, yeah. making sure that these products are being adopted. Because you can write the best framework you want. If it's not tied to a product, it's not part of a product like a pre-launch pre, pre review, it won't be effective. And that's one of the things that many companies miss. They bring in like some folks once in a while, talk about responsible AI and move on. They don't build the infrastructure to ensure that as products are being designed, deployed and uh, um, operationalized, they have this responsible AI layer built into them it so goes also through collaboration. What, what, you mentioned infrastructure, right? What is that infrastructure? Well, that, that's the infrastructure of collaboration uh, 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 I mentioned here. Um, like maybe like what the teams are working together to develop and you then make sure that that kind of becomes like a standard and is exactly. used every time. So that, le- that type of infrastructure, not actual infrastructure, I guess. No, yeah. exactly. That's the type of question. Again, it starts with like, think about the way you, you, you use AI usually in companies that is not like a non-AI like native, right? So what you do is like try to identify some business cases. Again, there are many relevant problems out there that are like what I call like machine learning compatible and mm-hmm. many of them are. Once you identify these business cases, you think you can create some value, immediately you ask yourself how things can go wrong. From the very beginning, I see lack of this value. I want to tap into that value I'm building from the very beginning the guidelines and the safeguards to make sure that I maximize that value while mitigating some of the risks by building that collaboration infrastructure from day one. That's the goal you should be aiming for. Yeah. So one thing you mentioned around awareness, and I made a note here that I just wanted to ask you about. When you're talking, you said it's important to like train employees uh, around responsible AI. I'm curious, I sort of feel like, you know, I live in this bubble of responsible AI and I'm kind of always thinking about it, but that's obviously not always the case with different people. So what is, if you had to sort of put a percentage to the awareness level of building responsibly today, broadly in the organizations that you've worked with, um, what is that level of awareness today? Well, I don't know if I can put a percentage on this. I put just that like, uh, let's focus on the dynamic. It's rising fast. It's rising fast for, for, for well, from like obvious reasons, right? The more you get like high coverage controversies, the more people like, you know, are aware of this and the more uh, businesses wants to, to uh, um, address this. But I would like to help them move from a defensive side and say, okay, I don't want to get into this bad PR. I'm using AI and I want to make sure that I'm not being associated with various controversies to how it can benefit me. Mm-hmm. Because my uh, um, point, the most important advice I always give them is on the long run, don't get confused. Only responsible AI companies will survive. Mm-hmm. Don't get confused for a very simple reason. Because responsible is about trustworthy AI. What's going on right now, I'm going to give you a sense about like, you know, mentioning any companies. Many of these companies are procuring black box system. You have no insight whatsoever into the design of that system, how it came into being is lineage, what was the training set, various like furnace matrix tests being run, you pass down that risk. So it comes with some risk, you deploy it, you have a customer facing company. Down the line, something wrong happened and you get caught by regulators because regulation is coming yeah. and really soon. So you turn around. So what happened is you have been a bit reckless. You mm. took on a risk from someone else. 
Yeah. Because you have no idea how the inner working of that system. It has impacted yeah. some people. And now, and that risk is systemic across the industry now. That, yeah. That's the reality of the industry, right? Yeah. We don't have the right vetting process. Going back on the pre-launch, you know, as part of the pre-launch like product. So many products have been just sent out there in the world. Okay. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah. And now what you have is like various reports, some academics find out something dirty and, and some journalists, but the you know, just that's just a small percentage of what's actually going on. Mm -hmm. And again, that's what I'm saying is on the long run, as a consumer, as a user, I want to make sure that your system is trustworthy. Mm -hmm. I don't want you to pass that risk on me. Yeah. That's why I'm saying on the long run, responsible is the only way to go. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I agree. I think uh, I really like your line around in the long run, only responsible AI companies will survive. So I don't know who mentioned this, but it's like, can we not think about AI and responsible AI separately? They're one thing. I came across this in some conversation. I don't remember who mentioned it, but it's like, let's not split it up. If you're thinking AI, it's always responsible AI. So that that kind of lines with this. So Lofred, as we're nearing here um, to the close of this 20-ish um, minute podcast, what are some of the three more, or not some, but what are the three most important things that you think teams should focus on as they are building AI slash responsible AI solutions over the next few years? Um, couple of things. The first one is like context is everything. Mm -hmm. There won't be, and we can discuss that, that uh, more, more at length, but there won't be any of the shelves, finished matrix, solutions are going to help you, they won't. Mm -hmm. There will be like dozens of different like funnels matrix uh, that you can you know, look, look, look at there, various you know, books on explainability, whatever it is, but context is everything. Mm -hmm. So it means that you will have to adapt that knowledge to your very like context that you have. That's a very good point. That's very, very important. Like there won't be, you know, I'm, again, I'm working with it off AI systems. Like, yeah, yeah, it can get you to a certain point, but there's yeah. a point beyond which there's no like universal self requirement. So forget about that. Uh, software won't save you. That's the first point. Um, I would say- Wait, the, sorry, the what is that software save you? Software won't save you. Software, software won't save you, like, okay. Right, software won't, won't save you. You won't have this other you know, the shelves like kind of solution. Uh, it's too contextual. Um, the, the, the second one is it's everyone's responsibility. And that's why it becomes tricky because if you think about like business function, you like to say, okay, that's your responsibility and you have these data protection officers yeah, and okay. blah, blah. That's because of the very nature of learning systems and machine learning. Yeah. Um, it creates what I call like a set of you know, uh, challenges, governance challenges that are really like transversal. That's a general purpose technology. Mm -hmm. So imagine, let's say that you're a bank using 500 plus AI models across your operations from like you know, uh, finance to like credit, whatever it is. You can, and all of these you know, applications have associated risk, right? Easily, you cannot like envision that there's one person only looking at these 500, you know, models being used. Yeah. And again, they are learning systems, so that that could use ancient data. So again, that's really important. It's not just about having the right design requirements at the beginning. It's all about constant monitoring, assessment, and so forth. Yeah. Right now, you start to see multiply all the risks to associate with each of these models across like a bank operating globally, and you get a sense of what are the challenges that you are facing? It has to be an organization-wide effort. So that's the second point. Yeah. It won't be like a guy coming in or a lady coming in and solving this for you. That's impossible. Um, the third one, which is more philosophical, which is before we can properly discuss what AI should be doing and like you know, the responsible AI can frameworks, we need to come to terms with what AI can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. And that's where sometimes there's uh, magical thinking about machine learning, um, that's explained why many of the, not many, but some companies fail to really, I would say scale AI, you know, they never move like past the, you know, the, I think the lab, uh, full use cases and really scaling this up. They, never, they didn't crack it down to really scale this up. Uh, partly, not only, because of misunderstanding of uh, genuine capabilities mm -hmm. and limitations of your AI system. So, the first rule of responsibility is having a sense of what can you really achieve That's using right. that model. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. These are really good points. I really like it. So context is everything. It's everyone's responsibility. Really assess what AI can and cannot do. Exactly. So 
last question here, Lo Fred. How do you think responsible AI will evolve over the next few years? It's already coming, becoming sort of mainstream and quotes, but how do you think it will evolve? Uh, that's that's really interesting. So I said on the long run, like I think many of the yeah. uh, reckless actors are going to be pushed out of the market, yeah. not necessarily by regulation. As I told you, really for real business reasons, like you don't pass that risk on me. That's right. So so I'm not going to do business with you. So on the long run, uh, I think many actors are going to adapt or, or die. Um, but the more I would say, the more fundamental points um, is that we're going to get a better sense of the limitations of AI systems, mm -hmm. so we'll have a better use of it. Mm -hmm. And many of the challenges are not like inherent to, to AI for itself, it's bad use, bad implementation. Because one of the, the thing that uh, companies putting responsible AI um, processes in place often miss is the interplay, the interaction between the users and the systems. And many of issues raise, I know, arise at that junction, right? And it's really hard to foresee. Because that's why I'm saying it's not about like training your data scientist and give them basic like one-on-one -on -one ethical AI stuff. It's all about understanding the dynamic nature of AI systems as it interacts with various business functions and various individuals internally and externally. Yeah. And that understanding, I think, what I observe across the world, uh, across various like um, countries uh, in the West, because that's mostly where I work right now. Uh, there's an awareness of that. There's a growing awareness of okay, this might not be you know the silver bullet for that that business uh, business goal. Great. And do you think that um, so? I feel like personally, I think self regulation is sort of like a hard thing for companies to do. Do you think regulation coming is what is going to push them to really uh, start thinking about this seriously? Oh yeah, I think regulation is, is coming, and what I mean coming is like. It's a matter of a few weeks, a few months. I well, really in Europe, yeah. yeah. In Europe, like it's not like in five years' time, it's like by the end of 2021, you might get some regulation. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> be ready for that. That that's coming. Um, but beyond regulation, again, I don't want to be like just punitive. It goes back what I said about you know making sure that your system is trustworthy. And I do think that responsible AI um, is going to uh, penetrate every business function. Mm -hmm. And there won't be this like you may have like this chief responsible officer and so on, but I really think that's going to be a really transversal kind mm. of function. Uh, and now many companies, if you're looking at actually, interestingly enough, you have more and more companies building responsible AI teams and, and creating functions. Yeah. That wasn't the case five years time, five years ago. I wouldn't be surprised that responsible AI becomes like, let's, that's my bet. Uh, it's cybersecurity on story. Look at what happened in cybersecurity. 20 years ago, 40 years ago, no one was really like paying attention to this. I profile use case, every company is, have some cybersecurity uh, uh, you know, processes in place, right? If you use software, you need some cybersecurity. The responsible AI discussions are similar to cybersecurity on steroids. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so that's, that's what, what we're discussing here. Yeah. Responsible AI cybersecurity on steroids. I like that. <laughs> well, on that note, thank you so much, Lofra. This was a great discussion. I really enjoyed it. And I'm looking forward to having more such conversations with you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me.